And I am excited, I mean super excited about this series that we're kicking off today. So excited that we had t-shirts made because you need to remember what you're on this planet for. I'm wearing one, Elizabeth's wearing one. We're gonna be selling them after service um, out at the after party and you need to pick one of these up because you need to be reminded that you're not on this planet just to take up space and to breathe God's good air. You are placed on this planet to make a difference. And we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about the power and the importance of making, making a difference. Now, let me, let me begin by saying there is a, um, there's a, a phrase or a, a words that have maybe a resurgence of, of the phrase best life. And if you're on social media or if you go to bookstores and you see them very often, you know, you see, you see very often this phrase best life, a lot of books, best life, best life. And, and, and if you, if you go to, um, like, like um, Instagram or, or Facebook, um, you'll see pictures. Somebody, usually they're laying on the beach and you, know, you can see their toes and you can see the beach and you can see an umbrella. Maybe they're sipping on some lemonade because we love Jesus too much to sip on a lot of other things, right? And, and they're, they're just sipping on something and, and they have hashtag, hashtag best life now or living my best life now. You ever seen, come on, you know what I'm talking about? But how, come on, think about that. Is that really your best life? Come on, I mean, it's a good vacation and I'm not preaching against vacations because my wife, she loves a cruise ship. She loves the beach. She loves the mountains. She loves, she just loves to get away. So your preacher's not preaching against vacations, but is that really your best life? Or is it just a good vacation? Because I'm gonna know you can go away on a good vacation, but if you go away and you leave hard times, I mean, if you go away and, and you leave hurt, and you leave pain and you leave struggle behind, when you come back home from a good vacation, you get back home and realize you need what? Another vacation. I'm a little hot. I don't know if I'm as hot out there as I am up here, but I need to be turned down up here just a little bit. It seems really, really loud to me. If um, the sound, are the sound men in the sound booth back there? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, hurting my own ears today. When you need earplugs to preach to yourself, how I many know you're preaching too loud? Yeah. But, but I thought about that. That's not really our best life now. And what I, what, what I believe is that um, we have to ask ourselves the question because our best life is when we're using our life, the one life, the only life that we get we're using our life to make a difference, exercising the gifts and the talents and the purposes for which God created us and he brought us on the planet. But, but here's my concern. There are too many people that are so busy. There's too many people that are so busy trying to build a dynasty that they never take the time to step into their destiny and because they never realize their destiny, they never make a difference in the world. Now I want us to pray and invite the Lord to speak to us as we kick off this series about what it means to use the one life, the only life you have, to really make a difference. You ready? Put your hand on your heart. Receive this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, God, we do not want to waste our lives. So many in this, this room are tired of, of going through the motions. And Lord, we would ask that you would direct us. Lord, that you would reveal things to us. If there is areas of our life that need course correcting, that you would help us see what you see in us. God, because we want our lives to be used to fulfill your destiny, not to build dynasties. Lord, we want our lives to be used for your glory and to make a difference that outlasts our lives. Lord, we ask you to be a part of this message. May your spirit, may your glory rest on it. We know that outside of your spirit, this sermon is nothing more than another talk. But with your spirit, Lives can be changed. So Lord, take everything that I say that is of me and let people forget it. But everything that is said that is of you, may we remember it and apply it to our lives. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jeremiah, 
Um, the book of Jeremiah and the character of Jeremiah is a really, really interesting study. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Jeremiah in a moment, but I want to, I want to read to you briefly about Jeremiah's story. In Jeremiah chapter 1, you can go ahead and begin to, begin to, to, to go there. And the Bible talks about the word of the Lord coming to Jeremiah. He, he starts off chapter 1, verse 4, and he says, The word of the Lord, I, start, I want to do a whole series on the word of the Lord came to me. Because sometimes we think that when, when a prophet says the word of the Lord came to me, it's like they just heard something. They just had a, a feeling. They just were walking, you know, and, and all of a sudden they had this idea. But, but several times in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, the word of the Lord came to me. And I want you to understand every time the prophet of God says, the word of God came to me, he was talking about the literal presence, the literal power. The Bible refers to it as the Shekinah glory, which means the right now present, powerful, tangible glory of God came to him and it, and it spoke to him where he was. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he says, he, he said to me, I chose you, watch this, before I formed you in the womb, I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations but Jeremiah says, I protested and I said, oh no, not me, not me, Lord. He said, look, I don't even know what to say since I'm a youth. Then the Lord said back to me, do not say that you're only a youth. You'll go everywhere I send you and you'll speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid. And then he tells him why he doesn't have to be afraid. He says, because I will be with you. He says, I'm gonna rescue you. And that is the declaration of the Lord. Now, when you begin to, to, to look at that and you think about Jeremiah, who was Jeremiah? He, he was this prophet of God. He was the one that was called by God. He was gonna prophesy to the people of God, to the nation of Israel in the darkest time in Israel's history. When you look at his ministry, when you look at the call that was on his life, it was challenging, it was difficult. Jeremiah is the guy who's gonna to preach to Israel before and after they go into Babylonian exile. It is not an easy task. Nobody wants Jeremiah's job because he knows people are not gonna receive him very well. Yet he, he steps up and he says, God, whatever you want me to do, that's the, the very thing that I'm going to do. And in this, this, this study on Jeremiah, you, it's an interesting book to read because in it, you begin to, to literally see how God calls people I mean, you begin to literally see how God creates people to prepare them to be ready for that call. In, in that study, it's interesting because you begin to see how God actually sends people into their call to make a difference in the place where he's, where he's placed them. Now, here's what I know about you. You are God's divine design. You are not some mass clump of cells who were in the right place at the right time and accumulated into this mass of humanity that we now call you today. You are God's divine design. You, like Jeremiah, were known before you breathed your first breath. You were designed by God to be one of a kind, not just like everybody else, but like nobody else. He designed you. He divinely put you together with gifts and talents and abilities and, and, and giftings, and he even gave you the personality you have. Before the beginning of the world, he knew you. And he knew that when he made you, he was going to make you like no one else. He was going to position you in the place where he's placed you so that you could make a difference that would long outlast you. But what you, you have to remember is what God was saying to Jeremiah. Listen, you don't have to be afraid because you plus me is always a majority. And that's what he wants you to know. Listen, he doesn't want you to be afraid. He doesn't want you to walk in fear. He doesn't want you to walk in anxiety. He doesn't want you to walk in worry. He wants you to know you plus him is a majority wherever you go. 
And he's speaking to Jeremiah as he embarks on what is going to be the most challenging and difficult season of his life. Speaking to people who really don't want to be speaking, spoken to about what it is. I almost said speaking. Did y'all hear me? I corrected myself. My mom, the English teacher, would be proud of me. But some of you just need to be reminded what God reminded Jeremiah of that day. Don't you be afraid because you're going to go wherever I tell you to go. You're going to say whatever I tell you to say. And I'm going to be with you so you don't have to be afraid of who it is that tries to stop you. Sometimes we just need to be reminded that we, God knows who we are because God made us the way we are. We need to be reminded that if God is for us, it doesn't matter who is out there standing up against us. It doesn't, we need to be reminded that no weapon formed against us has the power to prosper because greater is the one that lives in you than anything that is going on. I don't know who needs to hear that, but you just need to hear this morning before you go to work tomorrow, before you walk into that meeting, before you walk into your next challenge, before you step into your next moment, season that God has for you, that, that greater is he that's in you than whatever it is you face in the world. You just, just need, to, need to remember that. It's interesting because God, God speaks to, to Jeremiah and, he, and he's calling him out and he's appointing him and he's about to, to set him apart. And, and, and what he says is, here's what God says beforehand. Watch this. This is a little bit, it, it, can I get deep with you this morning before we go have a party? Is that all right? No milk today, just some meat. Is that all right? Is that all right? He, he, so he says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something beforehand that's out in the future that I'm going to want you to do in your present. Now, now, now watch this because he said in Ephesians chapter two, there's a, um, there's a passage of scripture that, that maybe it's familiar to, it'll be familiar because you're familiar with Ephesians chapter two, um, verses eight and nine. And you, you'll remember Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine. It says that you're, it's by grace that you've been saved. Remember that? It's by grace that you've been saved, not by your works. Why? Because God doesn't want any man to boast, right? It's only by grace. You can't earn salvation. You can't, I mean, no, you can't be good enough to get to heaven. You can't be good enough to get God's favor. You know that, right? It's only by grace that you've been saved. Why? Because God doesn't want any man to be able to boast that he was good enough to get into heaven, right? But right after that, you know, verse 10, we always stop there. We stop with, with so that no man could most. Woo! But you know, that's not the end of that phrase. Verse 10 is, is also connected to that passage of scripture. And verse 10 is where God says, he says to people, we are, we are God's workmanship. Paul's teaching this very young New Testament church. And he says, listen, no, quit trying to work out your salvation by your works. Quit trying to behave good enough to earn God's favor and his sovereign grace. You, you can't earn God's grace you, because God doesn't want man to be able to boast about God's favor or God's grace on his life. And remember that you are his workmanship. Watch this. Don't boast about your salvation. It only comes through grace. And then remember you only are what you are because God saw you before you were. Watch this. We are his masterpiece, his workmanship. Watch this now. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God, watch this, prepared when? In advance. When? Beforehand. God created you in Christ Jesus, right? And then he had good works planned for you that he established when? Beforehand ahead of time that all of us should do. Now, now what, here's what God's really saying. Watch this. You might want to write this down. I put it in your notes so you can see it because I think this is really, really, really powerful. God in the past, God, he prepared works in the future for you and I to actually do in the present. That's what, he, that's what he said. That's what Paul said to Ephesians. Don't try to take credit for your salvation because no man can earn it. It's only by grace. And remember, you're his workmanship. And beforehand, in advance, he plans works for you to do when you actually show up. So in the past, God created things for you to do in the future 
for you to step into in your present. Now, here's, here's what that means. It, it means, it means that God believes in you. It means that God believed in you before he ever formed you. And, and the question that we have to ask about that, this whole thing is about believing. It's about, do you believe? I've told you many times that the greatest leadership quality of all leadership qualities is the belief that you matter. Because if you don't believe you matter, nothing you do will matter. But the belief that you matter so much to God that God made you, he created you, and he put something in you because he wanted you to have what you need to make a difference in the place where he placed you. It's the only time you'll make a difference is if you believe that you matter so much to God that he put in you what you needed to make a difference. Does this make sense to anybody? So in the past, God looked into the future and he purposed you, he planned you so that you could pull from that plan and make a difference in the present. But here's the reality. It's what we have to think about every day. And that is this. Do you feel, listen, Cornerstone, those here in the room, those watching online, do you, do you, do you feel that you're making that difference? Where, where you are right now, do you feel that you're, do you really feel like Cornerstone? Come on, that you are living out the works that God planned for you in advance? Think about that. Come on. Do you, do you feel like, do you believe, do you think that you right now in your present moment, you're living out the works that God planned for you to live out right now in the present? If it's true that in the past, God looked in the future and he made you and he created good works for you to do, for you to pull out of his plan and do it in the present, it's important that we ask the question, am I doing what he put me here to do to make a difference in the span of time that he has me on the planet? That's what we're gonna talk about. For the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about what it looks like to, to reach into the future and to pull out of that plan and to make a difference in the world that God placed me in today. Do you feel like, come on, think about it. Do you feel like you're carrying out the good works that God prepared in advance for you to do? Are you just waking up every morning, you know, going to work, coming home, flipping on the TV, getting up the next morning, going back to work, coming home, flipping on the TV? Getting up, going to work the next day, coming home, flipping on the TV. Are you really using your gifts, your talents, your personality, the things that God's given you to make it? Because here's what I know. You're never, listen, you're never close. You know you're as close to God as you want to be right now. Oh, I want to be closer. No, all of us, I am, you are, we are all as close to God as we want to be right now. Are we using, am I using my gifts, my abilities, my talents? Because you're never closer to God. Listen, you're never closer to God than when you're doing the thing that God created you to do. You're never, listen, you don't, you're not closer to God when you're in the midst of worship or when you're in the midst of prayer or when you're here in the word. You're never closer to God than when you're actually doing the things that God created you to do. That's when you're closest to God. Are you using, if it's true that in the past God looked into the future and he created gifts for you to do in the present, are you with your life, with this one life, are you making a difference in the place that God placed you to do that even, even today? I wonder if, if, if it's, I mean, if that's you, if maybe, are you doing that? Maybe you're here and you're like, you know, preacher, yeah, boy, I'll tell you what, me and God, we are like that. I mean, we've got this, we are, we are walking step in step. Well, good, good for you. Awesome, keep up the great work. But if you're here and you'd say, you know what, Scott, the truth, the truth is that um, I, not, I may not actually be doing what God's called me to do to, to really make a difference I may not be pulling out of that plan and applying it to my present to make a difference in my home, to make a difference in my marriage, 
to make a difference in my family, to make a difference in my job, to make a difference in my church, to make a difference in my community, to make a difference that long outlives me. Are you, are you making a difference with your life that will outlive your life? Because I can tell you this, then and only then are you living your best life now. It's only when you believe that God in the past looked into the future and created good works for you to do and you have pulled out of that good works list that God planned for you and you've decided that you're gonna do that. That you're living your best life now, that you're really making the difference that God created us to make in the, in the world. I, um, uh, I, I want you to hear me, hear me say that if you, if you don't feel like that's where you are right now, if you, don't, if you don't feel like you're really using those preordained gifts to make a difference in the world, you're in the right place. Some would say good luck, but because God doesn't bring luck, I would say you're in good sovereignty because God brought you here right now. God brought you here to hear his word. God brought you here to help you hear the question that we all need to hear. And that is this, am I, am I using my life for the purposes that God created my life? If I believe he saved me sovereignly, do I believe he also sovereignly in the past looked into the future and created works, good works for me to do in my present? Do I believe that he loves me so much that he chose me to live in this time, in this space, in this air, in this geography, and in this generation to live a life that makes a difference? Because how many know you can live out your whole life and never make a difference? Did you know that? Come on. Did you know you can live your whole life and never make a difference? But I can tell you this, you can never live your whole life pulling from the plans God has for you and not make a difference. God, God created you with plans that, that he wants to make a difference in, in, your, in your life. It's a powerful, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful picture. Paul said, <coughs> Paul said to the Ephesians, he said, you're, you're his workmanship. You're his workmanship. You're his craftsmanship. If you look in the original language, do you know what that literally means? It means you're his poem. It means, listen, it means your life is God's poem. which forces us to ask the question, what kind of a poem for God am I allowing my life to write for him? Your masterpiece, your craftsmanship, God's poem. You, did you know that? Did you realize that you are in the original language when Paul said that to the Ephesians, they literally knew that Paul was saying, you are the poem of God? Your life is writing a poem for God. What will the story, what will the poem of your life say about God to the world? Your craftsmanship, he worked you in to his plan to write his story. That, that for me, I don't know about you, but that is just such a powerful picture of the importance of you and I making a difference with our lives. I'm, my life is God's poem. What kind of a poem am I writing for God with, with my life? Now watch this, this is powerful. God created you. How many believe he created you on purpose? Come on. I'm gonna ask you again, not a trick question. How many of you believe God created you on purpose? 
Okay, now how many believe he not only created you on purpose, but you believe he created you on purpose with a purpose? Let me see your hands. Okay. In Psalms chapter 139, 139, listen, I I just gotta stop because so many times, can I go back to the poem thing? Is that all right? Somebody, you ever heard somebody say, boy, life just keeps happening to me. Boy, life just keeps happening. You ever heard somebody say that? Life just keeps happening to me. You ever heard that? See, so often we think, you know, life doesn't happen to you. You know that, right? Life happens through you. You realize that, right? There's a big difference in life happening to you and life happening through you. That's why you're, you're God's poem, because what happens through you, how you write what happens to you is the way life gets through you. And it says, Paul says, listen, we're his workmanship, we're his craftsmanship, we're a poem that he's writing for the world to see about his good works that enable you and I to make a difference in the world. Psalms 139, it it says this, I love it because it, it starts off with all, say all. That, listen, that means every single one of them. Watch this. It says, all the days ordained for me. How many days? How many? That means the good ones and the bad ones, right? All the days ordained for me were written in your book. They were what? Written, right. How many of the days were what? Written, right? All my days have been written. Watch this. And then he tells us when. Before one of them came to be. So how many of the days of our life were already written? Where, where, what, what, they were what? They were written. And then when were they written? Before one of them even came, came to be. Now, I I love that because it it gives us a, a really beautiful picture of this reality that God doesn't just look at the totality of your life. It's not, it's not like God is looking down from heaven and he wants to see the sum total of your life. But you know what God is saying he wants to see? Every day of your life. It doesn't say the sum of your life was written before time. It says all of the days, every day of your life, every single day of your life was recorded, which means God isn't looking at like the sum total of all of your days. It just reminds us that God is looking literally at all of your days. God, Listen, did you know God doesn't just have a plan for your life, but he has a plan for all of your days. Come on, look right here, look right here. Did you know that God doesn't just have a plan for your life? But it says he has a plan for every single one of your days. And so many times we look at life like, we say things like this, one of these days I'm going to. Someday I'm gonna do better. Someday I'm gonna do this. One day I'm gonna do that. God doesn't look at your life as a sum total. God looks at every single individual day of your life because every single day matters. Every day mattered to God. Listen, every day mattered enough to God that he wrote down every day of your life. And how many knows if it matters enough to God to write it down before you're born, it ought to matter to us. He said, and we, we, have, to, we have to understand that life, watch, life is, a, is about the compounding of all of our days. You know, if you're in the financial world, they'll tell you the most powerful thing in finance is compounding interest. Every day your money working for you just a little bit more. Start early so it has longer to compound over time. It's the same thing with your life. That's what God is saying through, through the psalmist in Psalms 139. All of your days were written for you because all of your days compound day after day after day after day to become the sum total of your life. That's why today matters. Every single day matters that you make a difference with, with your life. Every day. You look at John 10, 10. You ever wondered what the purpose of Jesus is? He tells us in John 10, 10, he says, watch this, the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy, but I have come that they may what? Have real and eternal life, more and a better life, better than they've ever dreamed of. I love that translation. Because it gives us the purpose, it, the purpose of God. And sometimes we're look, we look at that they and it's like, not me, but it's them. And, and we, love, we, we love that. I mean, everybody wants to have abundant life, right? I mean, how many, everybody wants a better life than they've ever dreamed of, right? 
And he says that that's what I came to give you. But so many times, so, so many times, we believe that's for somebody else and not for us. And that's a great promise for them. It's not for me. You know why sometimes? Because you know you and I know me. Sometimes we don't receive promises like that. Like we don't really believe that God would want to do something supernatural, something amazing, something great and new through our life, through my life. You know why? Because I know me. And I, I know me and I know God knows me. And I know the mistakes I make and the failures in my life. And, and I know the shortcomings that I have. I know my deficiencies. And sometimes because I know, I know me and you know you, we disqualify ourselves from the things God wants to do through us before we ever attempt to do what God wants to do through. It's the reason you can, you can bless and speak life over other people, but you have a hard time blessing and speaking life over yourself. It's the reason someone can come in my office and I can, I can say, listen, it's gonna be all right. You're gonna make it through this. Listen, the God that's in you is greater than, than the things that are going on around you. If God's for you, it doesn't matter who stands up against you. You're gonna be all right. You're gonna make it. God's got great things in store for your life. That's easy for me to do. But sometimes it's hard for me to stand in my mirror and look in the mirror and say, Scott, God has great things, better things in store for your life. God, God's for you. He's not against you. It doesn't matter what they say. You keep focused on what I say. Why? Why is that easier for me to do it for somebody else than it is for myself? Because I know me. And it's for you because you know you. It's powerful. I mean, it's such a, a powerful, a powerful, powerful picture. But here's the reality. The reality is that God knows you and he still chose you because God never allows our past to define our future. Because God knows there's things that in the past, he looked into the future and created. And he knows if we would just pull from those things, his sovereign grace in our lives doesn't disqualify us, but qualifies us. He knows that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. God doesn't call me to do something because I'm good at it. God calls me to it and he makes me good at it. Because listen, if you think you can do what God's called you to do, it's probably not God calling you to do it. If you think you've got what it takes to do what God's calling you to do, you've got the personality, you've got all the gifts, you've got all the talent to do what God's calling you to do, he's probably not calling you to do that because God doesn't want you to do anything that you don't have to be dependent upon him to do it well. So often we disqualify ourselves from making a difference because we know ourselves. And I just wanna, I just wanna, wanna challenge you. Over the course of, of this week, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna challenge, challenge you because we've all got issues. How many know we've all got issues? Come on, how many, how many of you know, like you know your issue right now? Just raise your hand. How many know you got issues? Raise your hand. Okay. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you are lying in God's house. And that is your issue. We, <coughs> we've all got issues. But, but, but the challenge is, we know ourselves. We know ourselves so, so well. But here's the, here's the truth. God
God knows you. God knows me better than I know me. And there's nothing I've ever done that has disqualified me from doing what God wants to do through me. There may be repentance. There may be a season of, of healing. There may be a season of restoration. But nothing I do in my present will ever change God's mind about what he ordained for me in the past. And when you begin to believe that about you, that's when you and I begin to believe that we actually can make a difference in, in the world. But God never makes a mistake about his calling. You know, God never, God never says, hey, Bill, come here, Bill. Bill, come here, I've got something for you to do, Bill. And then when Bill gets to him, he goes, oh, wait a minute. I didn't mean Bill, I meant Bob. Sorry, my bad, my bad. God never, he never has a case of mistaken identity. When God called you to make a difference in your family, to make a difference in your home, to make a difference in your job, to make a difference for the kingdom, to make a difference in the church that he's called you to, he knew that it was you. He called, listen, he called you, you wanna write this down. He called you to make a difference, but he will never make you do what he's called you to do. He called you to do it, but he'll never make you do it. The man that he called you to be, he's called you to be that man, but he'll never make you be that man. The husband, the father, the friend, the employee, the employer, the leader, the servant. Whatever it is he's called you to do, he called you to do it and he'll never take it back. The Bible says the call of God is without repentance. God will never repent for his call on your life. But just because he called you to do it doesn't mean he'll make you do it. In fact, he won't make you do it. If he makes you do what he called you to do, and you didn't choose to do it, he violated his own law of free will. And how many know God doesn't violate his own laws? Is this making sense to anybody today? You, I, he called you to make a difference. Would you, would you say this with me? Say today. Come on, say it again. Say today. Say it again. Say today. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year. Come on, say today. Today is the day that I'm praying. Everybody in this room will decide to use your life to make a difference. God created you to make a difference. He didn't create you, like I said, to take up space on the planet and breathe his good air. God created you to make a difference in the places and the spaces that he has placed you in. In Hebrews chapter nine, the Bible says, we don't like to talk about this a lot, but the Bible says that, that a man is destined one time to die. Man gets to die once, right? It's appointed unto man, the Bible says, one time, destined to die, one time. And after that, he faces what? The judgment. How many have that one hanging on your wall in your house somewhere? I mean, it's not one of those scriptures that we put on a plaque and hang on a wall somewhere because we don't like to talk about death. We don't like to think about eternity. But every once in a while, how many know we all think about eternity? You know why? You ever, you ever thought about that? Why do I think about death? Why do I think about eternity? You ever, I don't want to think about eternity, but sometimes you think about eternity. You know why you think about eternity and can't help sometimes thinking about eternity? You know why? Because the Bible said God has put eternity in every man's heart. Because it's in your heart. It's in my heart. My job as, as a preacher, you know, I didn't become a preacher to make friends. You know that, right? I became a preacher because God, God called me and God anointed me to, 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 to tell people the truth. Not to, not, I get to make friends along the journey. That's just an added benefit. But God didn't call me to do what I do to make friends. God called me to do what I do to tell the truth about what, what he already, already said. My job, my job is to help people make a difference with the one life that God's given them. And that's this life that will prepare them for the next life. 
It's appointed unto man once to die and then we go to the white, great white throne judgment and we face God. See, listen, we, we live this life, we spend our time preparing in this life for how we're gonna spend the next life. How many know eternity is a mighty long time? This, this life that we're in right now, the, the Bible says it's, it's just, it's fleeting. And in Psalms 39, let me just, just close your eyes. Let me tell you a prayer that, that I think is, is helpful for us to pray sometimes. Just, just close your eyes and Father, today, Lord, help me. Lord, help my mind to remember how brief time on this earth is. God, help me to remember that my days are numbered. Help me to remember, God, that my life is fleeting. Help me to remember, God, that that my whole lifetime is just a moment to you. God, help me remember that human existence, my existence is just a breath compared to you. When you begin to think, watch this. When you begin to think of your life, watch me now, you can look up. When you begin to think of your life as fleeting, your life is short, your life is a vapor, here today and gone tomorrow, but you begin to realize that the way you spend this life is preparation for what happens in that life. Imagine, imagine this. Imagine uh, me and Elizabeth, we get into a, we get into a fight and um, it's not really a fight because we don't fight. We have um, heated fellowship. And, and so, so let's say we had heated fellowship and you know, uh, I I snapped off at her and she snapped off back at me and you know we're back and forth with each other and and we don't you know we don't want to be around each other and I want to leave the house and she wants to leave this house I just want some space and 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 but we can't leave because we've got to go somewhere together so we have to get in the car together and we're both like and and I get in the car first and um it's my car I turn on the radio and turn on a song I know she doesn't like she gets in the car and just looks at me and I'm like, yeah, what? My car, my radio, my music. And we're still like bickering at each other because we love each other. You know, you always treat the ones you love the, the most, the worst. And we've got all this time and we'll, we'll make up. It'll be better, you know, later. But then as we're in the car traveling to this appointment, <clears throat> Elizabeth, because she's always the most mature one and the wisest one, she looked over at me and she said, Scott, what if, what if we knew that we only had 30 days left to live? How would it change the way we talk to each other? How would it change our attitude toward each other? How would it change the way that we, we live? See, when, when you look at your life as though you have the rest of your life, it changes what you do with your life right now. It changes your priorities. It changes what's important to you. But when you, when you look at your life, when I look at my life and, and we begin to realize that, you know, I don't, I don't, have, that much, I don't have that much time left I'll tell you what it does you know what it would do in our marriage it would reprioritize things it would reprioritize the way we speak to each other it would reprioritize the way we act towards each other and when you and I begin to look at our life like Psalms 39 says look at your life it's just a vapor I mean it's here today and going tomorrow just a short period of time eternity is a long time what we're in this space right now is just a vapor when you begin to look at your life through the lens of heaven, you know what it'll do? It'll reprioritize your life. When you begin to realize, no, I don't have as long as I think I have, it'll reprioritize the things you do, the things you say, the things you don't do. 
It'll reprioritize the way you speak to your family, you speak to your friends. It'll reprioritize the things you talk about at work and you don't talk about at work. It'll reprioritize when you get into God's house and when you just lay out of God's house. It'll, it'll reprioritize the people you tell about Jesus and the people you don't tell about Jesus. It'll reprioritize the things that you've committed to and the things that you need to pull back from. When you begin to look at your life, like what I do in this life is preparation for that life and I only have just a little bit of time in this life, it begins begins to reprioritize the things that we want to do in this life to make a difference that will long outlast me in the next life. You know the greatest, the greatest difference you'll make, the, the greatest thing you'll ever do is to make a difference in this life that outlasts you. In the, we built this church. You know why we built this church? It wasn't just to build a church. We didn't just build this building and say, hey, look what we've done. We built this building for your kids and for your grandkids and for your great grandkids. We didn't build this building for the people who live in the community around us now. We built this building as a beacon of hope that would outlast any of us and continue to be a beacon of hope year after year after year after year, way after we're gone. Listen, here's my question about this whole thing. Are you building a life now that's gonna outlast you later? Are you using your life to make a difference now? Is your life making a difference in your home? Is your life making a difference in your family? Is your life making a difference in your church? Is your life making a difference in your workplace? Is your life making a difference in your community? Is your life making a difference? Because you're his workmanship. Your life is his poem. And there are things he created way back in the past. As he looked in the future, he created good works for you to be doing. Because he trusted you. Because he, he trusted that when, when, your, when your time came, when my ta- time came to occupy the planet, that we would reach into his preordained plan and we would pull out those works that he called us to do. And we'd be faithful to make a difference in the time that he's given us on his planet. You know what the Bible says in, in, in Psalms chapter 112, it says a righteous man is remembered forever. Will we be remembered? Will we be remembered for the difference that we made in the world that God has placed us in? You're never closer to God than when you're doing the things that God created and called you to do. And I, I know that, that, that God is sovereign and this doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. I know that your salvation is, is, you know, is a part of God's sovereignty and God is sovereign over your salvation and my salvation, but your destiny and my destiny To make a difference is our responsibility. While God's sovereign over your soul and your salvation, your will, my will to make a difference in my home, in our community, in this church is my responsibility. Your salvation, that's on Him. The difference you'll make in the world that's on you. God will call you to do it, but he'll never make you do what he's called you to do because that's on us. I wanna be a church that makes a difference. I wanna be the church that if this building blows up tomorrow and all of us disappear, this city will know that we're gone. They'll miss us if we're gone. I want my life to make a difference. So if I'm gone, my wife, 
my kids, my legacy long outlast my life. I want to be known as a servant. I want to be known as one who serves because the servant is always remembered longer than the leader. How many want to make a difference with your life? Just keep your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, you see every hand that's raised. Lord, every person who has a desire to, to use this one life that you've given us to make a difference in the world around us, to make a difference in the world after us. God, we want to use our lives to, to be the difference, to make a difference that we would be remembered after we're gone. God, we want to be the people who reach in to your plan for our life and pull out in the present what you planned for us in the past. God, because we want to be people that make a difference. Lord, I pray this week, I pray this week as we look in the mirror, as we wear these shirts, as we're reminded that we're never closer to you than when we're fulfilling your plan for our life. And your plan for our life is to make a difference with the life that you've given us now. Lord, help us make a difference that long outlast us. That we'll be remembered for the works that we did for you, that you planned long before we were born. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for reminding us that you created us on purpose and with purpose. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, thank God for his word. Next Sunday, next Sunday morning, I know that the, the board and the staff are doing pastor appreciation, but nobody else is coming in to preach. I'm preaching next Sunday morning and I'm gonna preach. I'm gonna continue this sermon because I'm gonna tell you next Sunday morning, watch this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you four things that God says you can do today to make a difference. Four things, you wanna make a difference? I'm gonna give you four things that God says that we do now, today, every day to make a difference with our lives. Will you, will you be praying about next Sunday? Will you be praying that you'll be receptive to hear what God wants you? Listen, I've gotta let you go because the party's gonna begin, but is there anybody here, anybody here who doesn't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I talked about the plan that he had for you in advance. His first plan for you is to receive him as your savior. You can't reach in to his ultimate plan for you until you first establish his first plan for you. And that is that you would know him. If you're in the room and you would say, Scott, I don't know him the way I need to know him. I don't know him as my personal Lord and Savior. He's not Lord of all in my life. Maybe you have in the past, but you've drifted away. Maybe you never have before. Maybe you came in the wrong way, but you came into the right place. And God wants you, God wants you to have an opportunity to get right with him. Don't worry about who's looking around. We don't close our eyes in this place because if we, if we, can't, if we can't celebrate new life in Jesus in here, we'll never, never be able to walk in life with Jesus out there, amen? So listen, not because you're afraid of eternity, but because you believe living with Jesus is better than living without Jesus. And you would say, Scott, pray for me today because I'm not where I need to be, but I wanna be. Raise your hand. Just raise your hand if it's you. Hold them up high, I wanna see you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you. God bless both of you, bless you. Come on, hold in the very back. God bless you. God bless all three of you, bless you. Anybody on this side of the room? God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am, I see you. Anybody else? God bless you in the very back. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, you ready to pray, everybody together? Come on, let's pray with those who raise their hands. Can we say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace that covers my darkest sin and my greatest mistake. Come on, pray it like you mean it. Forgive me today. Wash away all of my sins. Give me a new life. Empower me with the Holy Spirit. In your strong name I pray, amen, amen, and amen.